Welcome to Millennial 725. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. And I'm Pamela. Happy belated 4th of July. We're recording on July 5th. I was cracking up at these fireworks stands that popped up all over the area because as we touched on last week, it's not the best idea to light to set off fireworks when, particularly on the West Coast, uh, the ground is very dry right now. They're a fire hazard. Well, I'm looking at these fireworks stands that have popped up. All of them are plastered in signs that say, no smoking, no smoking near the fireworks stand. And I'm like, you people have some nerve. You're willing to set forests on fire, but God forbid anybody smokes near the fireworks stand because your place is going to be going up in flames. It just came off very hypocritical to me. Yeah, particularly given um, the climate issues y'all are dealing with out west right now. I mean, Andrew, I don't know. If it's quite as bad in Vegas as it is in the Pacific Northwest, but I can't imagine it's great. It's dry. It's dry. Yeah. Yeah. Did you two watch fireworks over the weekend? Nah. I sure heard them. (laughs) We (laughs) we heard them them. for sure. We don't personally partake because we have an old dog that fireworks freak out. So we usually just try to stay home and keep them tended to so they're comfortable. Yeah. Um, But yeah, it's been a while since I went to a fireworks show. Okay. It's crazy how shook dogs are by fireworks. Yeah. I felt awful. I gave Brooklyn a CBD dog treat to chill him out. I think it worked. Mm. I don't know, though, because we did walk up onto a hill to watch the fireworks. We went onto this uh, man-made hill that's uh, just a-, a huge pile of dirt for construction that's happening nearby. We had a sweeping view of the entire Vegas Valley. It was incredible. So we were very pleased to be able to watch the fireworks, especially especially this being our first year here. Um, we could see every damn firework across the entire valley and a lot were being shot off. Um, so that was a really cool experience. I have seen a lot of people complaining about fireworks like on social media last night And like you two, you don't seem really drawn to them. I do enjoy them. I get the dangers. I'm sad they stress out dogs, but they're fun to watch. They are beautiful. I like them. I like them. I just wish that people would not take it upon themselves to shoot them off. Um, And and that's what really kind of makes me a little bit nervous. Yeah. Uh, But I, I enjoy a good firework show. Like a Disney fireworks show or like going to the fair and they always have fireworks shows. I think we should just leave it to the professionals. Yeah, I was going to say in a controlled setting, I've got no problem with it. But when it comes to, you know, Bubba and Beanie down the street setting off fireworks in their front yard, um, terrible for pets, terrible for the environment, terrible for the local wildlife. Um, So I'm really a big proponent of letting, you know, theme parks, even cities, if they want to have their own fireworks show. I mean, New York City does an amazing fireworks show. Um, I got to see that about six years ago. I got the reminder in Facebook. Um, I got to go down to Brooklyn and watch and it was just so beautiful. But again, it was a controlled professional environment. And that's what we should really stick to. And like so much trash is left out. I don't know oh, if it's yeah. the same with you guys, but but mm-hmm. like out here they canceled all of the fireworks shows within, mm-hmm. you know, like a, a enough of a radius that you would want to drive out there. Um, probably partially because they're still a little bit nervous about, you know, the COVID variant, but also just because of the drought and it's been windy and hot. And I think that just really emboldened people to buy their own. But I was driving to the grocery store this morning and it's just like such a mess. So in addition to, you know, everybody deciding they're going to do their own fireworks show, I just really wish that my neighbors would pick up after themselves if they're going to do it at all. In my neighborhood, too, when I was walking Brooklyn this morning, the trash was everywhere. And I need to go look again to see if they cleaned it up. Because I'm thinking, like, if you are going to set off fireworks, at least clean it Yeah. Up. You know, grab a broom, take five, ten minutes to do it, even the next day. Because of our great view, I did enjoy the fact that every random bubba around town was setting off fireworks. <laughs> but in normal years, yes, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of that. But, la- uh, but last night... Really enjoyed it. Me and my hard seltzer and my drone really enjoyed it <laughs> on Pato. Speaking of things up in the air, this broke a little over a week ago a week ago now, but we haven't gotten a chance to talk about it yet. 
There has been a new report released by the U.S. government about UFOs. This report says no signs of aliens, but 143 mystery objects are still unexplained. The study is part of the most significant public effort so far to deal with decades of speculation, rumor, and unhinged conspiracy theories about UFOs. Some of the most intriguing cases come from Navy pilots who reported seeing UFOs and filming some of them off the East Coast of the U.S. over a period of months in 2014 and 2015. The pilots, including some who have spoken publicly, say the mystery objects moved with exceptional speed, agility, and acceleration that they had never seen before. And in some incidents, the pilots said the objects were underwater, went underwater. So they flew from the sky down into the water. I find this report fascinating. I think these are aliens. I think they're aliens, and I think they're purposely avoiding us. That's the thing. Some people say, well, if aliens were real and they were actually here, we would see them by now. Maybe they're purposely avoiding us. I mean, I would avoid us, too. We're yeah. kind of awful. <laughs> For real. They're probably so advanced that they don't even want anything to do. Like, what are they going to give us? Nothing. Yeah. We're just going to take everything. Yeah. Right. No, and I'm... we're going to freak out. I'm with you, Andrew. I've believed in aliens for a long time. I think that it's really probably there's a lot of hubris, I think, in the thought that human beings on Earth are the only intelligent life in the galaxy. Like, no way. No way. But I also don't think that any other intelligent life in the universe gives that much of a shit about us because think about it. Think about how vast and endless it is. There's probably way bigger fish to fry than us. They're just watching us down here have our dumpster fire on Earth. And they're like, (laughs) well, okay, Earth will probably take care of that problem. (laughs) We're we're just going to leave that alone. Yeah, like I don't believe in um I don't know if I believe in little green men, you know? No. So to speak. But but I it's it just seems impossible to believe that we're it right there's no way you know yep there's no maybe in in our um you know in our galaxy perhaps or in our solar system yeah but like not in like the entire galaxy great beyond yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i mean it gets me endless right (laughs) Mm -hmm. and the thing that gets me is that some of these ufos were reported by pilots This isn't Laura stepping out in her backyard high one night and thinking she sees something when it's just a balloon. You know, these are pilots up in the air and they see something. So that's what gets me about this. And there is video. You can take a look for yourself. These videos aren't crystal clear, but they're better than they used to be. And the objects that you see are pretty interesting. You can't really make heads or tails of what it is, but still. Yeah, but I think when we have... um top military officials saying that these objects are moving with a level of precision that we have not yet figured out how to replicate. Like, our own technology can't do this. It's interesting. It's interesting. Yep. (laughs) It's interesting for sure. Is it aliens? I don't know. But I also believe that they exist. Yeah. Okay. Well, That's our latest check in on the aliens out there. I know that the moment we find out that aliens are real, this world is going to collectively lose its mind, particularly people in America. We're going to be talking about how we need to kill them all immediately. And I also think they're far more advanced than us. Borders. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We're scared. A lot of people. I mean, I would be scared too. I just would not. I think. We shouldn't rush to assume that these aliens want to kill us. No, I don't think they care about us. Well, I think they care enough to study us. They probably can't make sense of what the hell's happening here. I think environmentally, maybe they have a sense, like you said, Laura, but like they uh, they don't know about our politics or anything like that. They're probably just checking in and laughing at the fact (laughs) that, you know, we're slowly killing ourselves with global warming and stuff like that and they're like they use zoom they can't teleport yet that's crazy (laughs) right assuming that they even know we're here because again the galaxy is vast and limitless so there may be intelligent beings out there that haven't discovered us yet 
And I think that human beings have a tendency towards imagining ourselves as like the center of the universe. So we think, well, like, of course they would want to know what we were about. Maybe they don't. Maybe they don't give a shit. (laughs) I wouldn't blame them. I kind of hope in my lifetime we don't really get confirmation about the aliens. (laughs) Let a future generation yeah. deal with that. <laughs> Andrew would it would just be too much stress for Andrew. I know. I, I'm I'm afraid of people like breaking into the house for no good reason. Like if I found out aliens were real, I wouldn't be able to sleep. Well, speaking of something else that might make you a wreck, Andrew, if you were to enter, um, Kroger is the latest to launch a drawing for money or free groceries for a year if you got vaxxed at their pharmacy. Um, Kroger, for anyone who doesn't know, is a chain of grocery stores in the United States. Uh, I got my vaccination there, which is why I know about this, because they texted me the other day being like, hey, like, thanks for getting vaxxed here. Enter into our COVID sweepstakes. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't. I can't believe this is where we are as a people. (laughs) It's so sad. But. I also think it's a lot of fun to talk about what we would do with a million dollars, because that's what Kroger is giving out. They're giving out a million dollars to five lucky winners and free groceries for a year to 50 other winners. So today and After Dark, we're going to be talking about what we would do if we won one of these COVID sweepstakes that's going on in the States. And what we would cook if we got free groceries for a year. <laughs> know if i want free groceries for a year from croaker <laughs> why you can get good quality food there i'm sure no there's there's stuff but again Publix is just superior and it, like the Publix deli Publix mm. fish counter like all of it is superior but you know package stuff i would go to kroger the Publix fish counter that was very specific <laughs> yeah they've got like a seafood counter yeah okay yeah cool <laughs> Andrew's like, let me just humor her. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like seafood, so. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's I'm really right. lame. Yeah. And something else I just wanted to bring up quickly. Can we talk about this Olympics bullshit for a minute? Mm. What happened with Shakari Richardson? Um, she was disqualified from running the 100 meter race because she tested positive for THC, which is the chemical found in marijuana that gets you high. Um. The reason for this, or the reason that she has given for this, is because Shikari learned about her biological mother's death from a reporter during what she thought was going to be a normal interview just days before the U.S. Olympic trials began. So she turned to marijuana for some stress relief. First of all, if she, and I made this point on Twitter, if she was able to run and win with THC in her system, I feel like it's more evidence of her talent (laughs) that she's a fast runner. Um, And secondly, marijuana, THC is not something that provides you any kind of advantage in athletics. If anything, it's the opposite. So it just seems completely ridiculous to me that she was disqualified for this. What did y'all think? Oh, yeah. It was so disappointing to see and an ugly reminder of how we how so many react to drug use in this country and in this world. Like, who cares? And and the context of this just makes it all the more worse. Just, you know, she had gotten high. She just found out her biological mother was dead, as you said. Like, I feel awful for her. Yeah, it's like we weren't we're not talking about steroids or anything like that. Mm -hmm. This is completely the opposite and it just kind of feels like it was a really easy excuse to disqualify her and it's really messed up some people have tried to compare her situation to what happened to michael phelps uh he ended up continuing to compete in the olympics but uh what i guess people don't bother to look up is the timeline was different the olympics were starting a lot several months after he was caught with the marijuana. So, you know, it's a different situation. People are just like quick to assume that there's a double standard going on here, but that doesn't seem to be exactly what's going on. Yeah. Uh, Nonetheless, she shouldn't have been disqualified. Well, I also think 
you know, if people want to try and make comparisons between um, this and the Michael Phelps case, what when did that happen? It was like 2009. We're in 2021. Right. Marijuana uh, legalization has increased significantly since 2009. So why are we still at a point where we're operating under old rules that maybe aren't as applicable now as they were back then? And they're probably even more complicated to overturn at the Olympics because that is a worldwide Mm -hmm. organization. So I have a hard time seeing that changing ever. No, it, it won't, unfortunately. I guess we should also note kind of following up on Pam's story a few weeks ago, the Olympics are on, right? They're still happening. There was some concern. I mean, I think the people of Japan are still concerned about the Olympics happening there, uh, but they are going to be happening. I don't know if I'm going to watch. I need like, there's just, there's just so much to watch. It's kind of overwhelming. Yeah. I usually tune into for for summer, I'll turn, tune into gymnastics because I enjoy that. Okay. But but I I don't watch like the full event. And that's only if I'm around because the thing is, is that you, you kind of have to go on their schedule. It's not really like it's a primetime event for a lot of this stuff. So Right. I guess some of the bigger, more popular sports are like gymnastics, mm-hmm. maybe. A swimming obviously Perhaps. is very big. I think I've watched yeah. swimming in years Depends past. on time zones, too. Yeah, swimming is yeah. fun. Mm-hmm. All right. Also, I just wanted to mention that we did discuss Bill Cosby's overturned conviction in our latest breaking news installment that's available to our Bay patrons. Uh, We were all very shocked and disappointed, just like everybody else was. And now I'm seeing I don't know if I can believe this, but apparently he's thinking about going back to doing stand up comedy events like I, the dude is old. I think he can barely walk like I do not see that happening at all. But if he did, I think uh, he would uh, face a lot of backlash. Maybe he'll become one of these celebrities who has a weird Twitter account where he just posts videos instead of actually writing out tweets. <laughs> kind of like, like what uh, OJ does, actually. Yeah. And I think Kevin Spacey kind of does that, too. Yes. He returns yeah, every Christmas. So anyway, aye, that aye. was that was very, very disappointing. All right. Well, jumping into pop culture, I had a question for y'all because I was reading a couple of articles about this. I'm interested to get y'all's take. Is Steven Spielberg a hypocrite? So I ask this because back on episode 509, Pam told us about how Steven Spielberg had championed a rule change that would have prevented streaming outlets from submitting their films for the Oscars. This was after Netflix's Roma took home three wins and earned 10 nods. Um, At the time, a statement from his reps said Stephen feels strongly about the difference between the streaming and theatrical situation. He'll be happy if the others will join this campaign when it comes up at the meeting. He will see what happens. Sources then close to Spielberg deny that he ever tried to bar Netflix from eligibility. And he also later clarified his stance in a statement to The New York Times I want people to find their entertainment in any form or fashion that suits them, he said. Well, now Spielberg's Amblin partners and Netflix have struck a deal that will allegedly have Amblin producing multiple films for Netflix per year. What a shift in philosophy. (laughs) Am I right? Oh, yeah. I think what shocks me most about this is presumably he's going to want these films that come to Netflix to be considered for the Oscars. Right. So these comments have aged very poorly and they're not even that old. No, I guess this is a form of entertainment that suits him now. So, you know, it, it, um, yeah, I, to answer your question, he's definitely a huge hypocrite now that he could potentially benefit from this. 100 percent because you're right this is only like roma was up for the oscars about two years ago now maybe Mm -hmm. only that's nothing and they were still they were going to be voting on these potentially new rules last year because of you know the roma stuff so i don't know yeah and i was reading a new york times article about this it was actually the same one that he gave um his clarifying statement to 
Um, but it had talked about how he was supposed to be at that meeting of the MPAA, I guess it was, and raise this issue. And I guess he ultimately didn't end up showing up to that meeting. So I don't know if he just got enough backlash from it that he decided to back off of the issue, let a little time pass, and then sign a deal with Netflix. But that's kind of what it seems like happened. Yeah, I mean, also money. It was probably a very attractive offer for him. And I think that to answer one of your later questions here, I think he probably did just evolve on this topic. I mean, like, how can you not see how the industry is shifting? Yeah. To be fair, maybe the pandemic changed his thinking on this, too. Yeah, that was my thing, too. It was like, if I wanted to put myself in a space of assuming positive intent here, I think it could be a very reasonable thesis or theory that um, seeing the way the pandemic has shifted the demand for this kind of entertainment has helped change his mind and realize, hey, better to get on the streaming train than to miss it, right? The other thing, too, is that for um, basically what, if I'm remembering correctly, what he wanted to um, ensure kept happening is that um, films still followed the old guidelines for Mm -hmm. um, Oscar consideration. And in order to even submit your film, you have to have screenings um, in New York and in L.A. for a certain period of time, um, in addition to having reviews in both of those cities uh, done by film critics. And so, you know, to your all's point about the pandemic, literally almost nothing went to the movie theaters last year. Right. And so by those old rules, like nothing should have been eligible for consideration at all. Mm -hmm. So... I think that there was um, there was no way he could he couldn't have walked this back. It right. almost seems like especially if like, for example, Spielberg has West Side Story coming out. Mm-hmm. They pushed that back so it could still be released in theaters. So that's now coming out at the end of this year in December. It should have come out in theaters last Christmas. And if they had decided to still release it, it would have had to go straight to streaming, in which case it wouldn't have been eligible. And that's like a huge release that would be that will probably have some sort of for your consideration campaign. So he would have had to eat his words there as well. Yeah. And it really seems like at the very least, sort of at the surface level that he is trying to position himself as having evolved his view on this. Um, He had this to say at Amblin storytelling will forever be at the center of everything we do. And from the minute Ted and I started discussing a partnership, it was abundantly clear that we had an amazing opportunity to tell new stories together and reach audiences in new ways. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Also, the money doesn't hurt. Yeah. (laughs) And I'm also thinking he's 74 years old. He maybe wants to join the future before his time is up. Who knows how much longer he's going to be able to be a working director for or alive for that matter. I would I would guess he maybe has another 10 years of directing, assuming he lives a long, long life. Yeah. So I kind of also see this as kind of maybe part of his swan song going out in the next decade or two, uh, looking ahead to where the industry is moving. Yeah. And being relevant to what people want. Right. Right. But yeah, I always love these kinds of stories that come sort of full circle and we can reference old shows from like a couple seasons ago and be like, hey, we have an update on this. It's a Hollywood ending. Yeah. (laughs) Maybe he was uh, he got addicted to Mandalorian and WandaVision over the past year and he was like, damn, I want to be a part of streaming. This rocks. I know. And uh, maybe he got really into Bridgerton and Stranger Things. I bet he loves that show. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, Stranger Things, I feel like, is a love letter to a lot of different genres, but I feel like, in particular, some Spielberg-inspired content, for sure. And Ted at Netflix was probably like, and we'll give you an unlimited budget. (laughs) The budgets are probably way bigger bigger than what he was getting at uh, Paramount. Is that where Amblin normally releases films? I believe sounds about right. I believe that was it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I bet Netflix is willing to give him a lot of money yeah. for these movies. 
Yeah, it didn't sound like there were any major limitations in the contract. Um, So it kind of sounded like Amblin is going to get a lot of free reign here. Cool. Well, I look forward to seeing what they come up with. Same. Cool. I wanted to talk about TikTok and specifically uh, Black creators on TikTok who are currently on strike over there. Have you guys been hearing about this? Because this has been making headlines for a while. Mm. Yes. So for anybody that's not in the know, the reason that Black creators are striking right now is because they're tired of not receiving credit for their original work. And sitting on the sidelines while predominantly white influencers often profit um, from s- kind of stealing their creative endeavors. Um, it happens a lot with choreography. TikTok is obviously very well known for popularizing dance trends. And a good majority of the time, those dance trends are choreographed by Black creators. But you would hardly ever know it if you didn't take the time to dig up who actually choreograph these dances and it's really hard to find so um it really sucks because it might not seem like that big of a deal a lot of people that are kind of rolling their eyes over this strike uh don't really see the bigger picture which is that views uh have a price tag and so when these white influencers rack up millions and millions of views doing these dances or recreating um, content that originated from, you know, a black creator that maybe didn't even blow up at all. It's also paving the way for them to potentially receive endorsement deals or um, advertisement, or uh, sometimes they can go on to break out of the platform and move on to uh, do more traditional Hollywood stuff. So it really is a bit of a slap in the face that um, oftentimes the TikTok algorithm doesn't favor the original creators of these things that get popularized over on there. Um, so the strike really started picking up momentum after Megan Thee Stallion released her latest single, Thought Shit, because her songs have in the past been used to create a lot of these viral dance trends. Uh, but there is no dance for Thought Shit, and it's because nobody has choreographed one. So mm. that really kind of showcases the power that these Black creatives have over there on the app. Um, instead, if you search f- uh, with the song sound, what you're really going to find is a lot of Black creators using the release of the single to vow not to create any more dance choreography for the song until they're properly given credit. Um, and then in lieu of choreography, creators are also just kind of sounding off on the cause and also using the hashtag Black TikTok strike to just inform people of what's going down right now. Uh, this obviously isn't a new issue. This has really been something that's been brewing since the app first launched or like rebranded back in 2016, I believe. Uh, Most recently, Jimmy Jimmy Fallon and The Tonight Show really caught a lot of heat for inviting one of TikTok's biggest stars, Addison Rae, who is white, onto their show in March. And while she was there, she performed a series of eight different viral TikTok dances, none of which she created herself. And there was no credit given to the original choreographer's On The Tonight Show, later on on YouTube, they added the names in the description box, but most people don't really check that. And following the backlash, Fallon and The Tonight Show ended up inviting the actual creators on via this massive Zoom call, and they were allowed to showcase how the dance was really supposed to go. So that was kind of like their way of trying to smooth things over. But obviously, it's still not right. And because this is not a new issue, it should really be something that, you know, a lot of these like traditional media outlets should be looking into before they're offering up opportunities to other people. Uh, TikTok says it's working to build a culture on the app that would involve crediting creators. But other than that, it didn't really offer up much of an immediate solution for this. Um, They released a statement where they said that TikTok is a special place because of the diverse and inspiring voices of our community. Our Black creators are critical and a vibrant part of this. We care deeply about the experience of Black creators on our platform, and we continue to work every day to create a supportive environment for our community, while also instilling a culture where honoring and crediting creators for their creative contributions is the norm. So that's where we are. But um, what did you guys think about this when you heard about it? My first thought was that this is just another in a long stream of events in which parts of Black culture have been popularized in white communities and thus made acceptable to the white people who saw other white people emulating those things. 
The same thing happens with hairstyle, for example. Hair has been such a common topic, um, just like in this whole sphere of like cultural appropriation that has been discussed over the last several years. Um, so this just feels like another example of that happening. And I guess my question to Addison Ray would just be, you know that you didn't create any of those dances. So when you were invited on a talk show that didn't know any better to perform them, why didn't you say anything? Maybe she did. I don't know. But yeah, that's possible. But she probably got tempted by the idea of going on The Tonight Show to perform these. She probably thought yeah. it'd be great for her career. Well, but, Jennifer you know, in a... the Discord is saying she also performed them badly. <laughs> oh, yeah. If you guys want to really like get a little riled up about this, you should look at some side by side comparisons between the way that she performed the dances and the original creators, because that's that's a good time. Um, but you're right, Laura. I mean, like you would think that if it's not her, then then her team. I'm sure she has one because you know she has also transitioned over into traditional Hollywood media. She is going to be starring in a She's All That remake, so she's she's doing just fine. But because she was also kind of um, involved in the whole Renegade credit scandal a couple of years ago, you would think that her team would have wanted to try and deter any sort of backlash because she's already kind of received a slap on the wrist from the internet for um, for being given credit where she didn't really deserve to have credit given. So. so it sounds like what they need to do is create a new field, a new setting where you can type in whose dance you are using, similar to how you can use a music uh, you can use a song or a music edit in your own TikTok and it credits the original source of that. Yeah. And maybe I'm sure TikTok would be able to detect when in a video somebody is dancing. With Snapchat and all these others, we can turn our faces into poop emojis. I'm sure they can detect when people are flailing their their arms and legs. Um and maybe if they can do that, which I assume they can, TikTok can say, hey, is this an original dance or is this from somewhere else? And that's where you type in that person to give them credit. So I assume that's what exactly. TikTok is going to do. Uh, maybe they should have just been more forthcoming with this information now instead of waiting until whenever it's ready. But that would fix this, right? Yeah, 100%. Mm-hmm. And I, I think also, too, like if you're creating anything, you should just... You know, be a little bit more aware of the fact that stealing is bad. It's kind of like a form of plagiarism. And just think about how you would feel if you created this thing and then got no credit for something that then goes on to be, you know, a national worldwide trend, whatever. Some of the responsibility does fall on the creators, I think. Yeah, and I there think are so tons too. of platforms where, you know, creators have no issue crediting originators and stuff like that. There's this really great article in the New York Times that came out a few years ago that talked about um, this issue because like I said, it wasn't, it's not really like a new thing. It's just kind of uh, reached a boiling point right now. And one of the points that the writer made is that a lot of times um, the people that get popular for doing these dances are actually taking them from other platforms Mm. so they clearly know that they've taken from somebody else and so the least they could do is say you know i got this dance from this person on dub smash for example or this person on instagram and i'm recreating it on tiktok yeah and i feel like isn't that part of the fun is paying homage to the original creator and like figuring out how to customize it and kind of make it your own, but still give that person their props. Yeah. I would think so. I I just don't get it. (laughs) Is part of the problem people haven't realized that plagiarizing dance moves is a thing. Maybe they just think that because they can recreate it in some cases badly, uh, they don't need to give credit because they are 
able right. to do it themselves. You know, like with a song, you can't really you can cover a song, but you can't perfectly recreate that song. So you have to give them credit. That's like abundantly clear. But with dancing, it's different because you are doing it yourself. And to be fair, it is really like it is really hard to copyright dancing and choreography. Um from what I understand, and I think it's probably because no one person is going to do it 100% exactly like somebody else. Every time. So even. every, yeah, every time. So that also gets murky as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, just like, I don't know, don't be a dick. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's what it really comes down to, right? Yeah. I think yeah. in this whole scenario, we ended up with the prime example of this issue taken to like one of the most extreme degrees, which was a creator who did not create any of those viral dances getting invited onto a show with a huge late night platform to recreate other people's work. Like something like that should have set off somebody's spidey senses (laughs) somewhere between the time she got the offer and performed on the show. Yeah. And Justin is reminding us, we may have spoken about this on the show, or I heard about it. Okay, yeah. So Mm -hmm. Fortnite, the video game, got in trouble for plagiarizing dance moves. That was And at the time, to all of those court cases, like when that was coming out or when it was happening, they were talking about the same thing, which is that it's really hard to say, like this person's dance, like the Carlton, for example, that Alfonso Ribeiro was trying to sue for the Carlton dance. But then it's really hard to say, like, that's original enough from, like, where he was inspired to create that dance move. Yeah. So it does get really murky. And I think that that um, I'm not sure exactly of the specifics, but I think that might be why it's so hard to, like, trademark um, specific dance moves or trademark specific choreography. Um, And then, like, of course, obviously, if you're not a celebrity, nobody's going to know that that dance move came from you. Be better people, people. This isn't too hard. Well, some people do have a hard time being better people. And speaking of that, we're going to hop into politics now. (laughs) We've got an update on the criminal charges that were levied against the Trump organization last week. Um, So it was charged with having a 15-year tax evasion scheme to help its executives evade taxes by compensating them with benefits that were hidden from the authorities. Shock and awe there. Um, CFO Alan Weisselberg has been accused of avoiding taxes on $1.7 million in dollars in perks. Um, the indictments described a, quote, deliberate effort by senior executives to underreport their income in concert with the Trump organization. In Weisselberg's case, the company kept his benefits off the books, but they kept a record of them in a spreadsheet. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Which like LOL. Um I <laughs> like what a boomer thing to do. Anyway, um some of the perks that he received included things like luxury cars, apartments, private school tuition for his grandchildren and more. So nothing that's shocking here. I feel like this is like with anything else related to Trump. It's all stuff we knew already. This is just confirming what we've already known for a very long time. But we wanted to share this because this isn't going away anytime soon. Um, So this particular case lays the groundwork for further investigation into whether the Trump organization manipulated property values in order to obtain loans and tax benefits. I'm pretty sure we know the answer to that. (laughs) They totally did. Um, And it's also possible that Weisselberg could cooperate with prosecutors. um, And that could be uh, hot water for the Trump family because he's been the Trump org's financial gatekeeper for over two decades. So if anyone knows where the skeletons are, he does. Yeah. So the question is, will he flip on Donald and family? And we just... Don't know, but I guess if the prosecutors are putting enough pressure on him, then maybe he will. But we'll see. I I choose not to get excited about any of this anymore because Donald and company have gotten away with so much. And stories like this is kind of what I've been calling dem porn, where like this gives us a freedom boner and it gives us a little hit of like, yeah, I knew he was bad. I knew it. Oh, yeah. But it doesn't really do anything. 
Trump might still run for president. He was still president for four years. Like, you know, when he was president, we were like, that'll get him. That'll get him. That'll get him. Nothing stopped him. So it's just kind of more of that, in my opinion. He's he's the Teflon warrior. Nothing fucking sticks to this guy. So I'm also not feeling optimistic that we'll actually get anything on Trump out of all of this, but I think it's important to surface it because we're going to continue hearing these stories in the years to come, particularly if he does decide to launch another campaign for 2024 or if he decides to run for a House seat like he has threatened. So we haven't seen the end of him. We've certainly not seen the end of Trumpism. I mean, look at some of the decisions that have come out of the Supreme Court in the last week, which thanks to Trump, is conservative leaning at this point. So uh, we're stuck with this shit for a while, guys. Buckle up. (sighs) I like how you said he's threatening to run for a house seat. (laughs) Threatening. (laughs) That's what it it feels like a threat to me. (laughs) Yeah, right. Of course. No, I agree. Just funny. I wanted to talk about something that's happening out in L.A., County. Um, so the LA City Council is now cracking down on homeless encampments. And we haven't spoken a lot about homelessness on the show, but it's obviously a really huge issue, not just like in the country, but also in a lot of these larger major cities. And a bunch of us have, you know, obviously lived in these major cities or still do. Um, so what's going down in LA right now is that they have passed a new measure. And uh, this happened last Thursday. It's being billed as a compassionate approach to getting people off the streets and restoring access to public spaces, according to KTLA. Uh, the new ordinance bans uh, sitting, lying, sleeping and storing personal belongings anywhere that would block sidewalks, streets and bike lanes. It also prohibits the aforementioned near driveways, fire hydrants, schools, daycare centers, libraries, homeless shelters, and parks. And the police would only get involved if there is an actual crime being committed. So they're trying to keep people out of actual jail cells. Uh, But those who resist leaving will be fined instead of arrested. So uh, this is kind of like a huge deal because the homeless problem has obviously really skyrocketed over the course of the last year because of the pandemic. Mm. It's nice that the city is trying to fix the issue, but you kind of look at this list and, and it seems reasonable, but then you think like, where are people going to go? Right. Yeah. And even before the pandemic, at least in LA, there were more and more people sleeping on the streets And the city does need to try and help them in some way. I mean, that's just what this comes down to. The solutions that they're trying to give the homeless aren't particularly attractive to the homeless. That's my understanding. Um, If you choose to join a homeless shelter, you have to be back by a certain time every night. I believe you can only bring a certain number of items in with you. So there are a bunch of limits that are turning people off from joining these shelters. So I guess they need to make the shelters more attractive of an option. Yeah. And I'm looking at this line about those who resist leaving will be fined instead of arrested. I mean, good. I'm glad they're not being arrested anymore. But how are you going to find a homeless person? I know. If they don't have a physical address that you can reach them at, if they don't have any money, like how... What are you going to do to incentivize people not to be in these spaces? Right, right. The other thing, too, is like aside from, you know, what Andrew was saying about making um, homeless shelters more attractive to people that need spaces um, is that there's like no space. That's the other problem as well here is that the city doesn't have enough rooms to house anybody Mm -hmm. or everybody. So. Um, that's obviously something that needs to be fixed. Last year, I think, or earlier this year, they started um, turning some shipping crates into tiny homes for um, homeless people. And I guess that's a good start. But it's clear that, you know, a lot of these urban areas are really struggling with how to deal with an issue that is just getting worse. And these cities could buy up old buildings that are no longer used and convert them into shelters. I mean, I think there's been examples of like hotels going under that are now sitting dormant 
That's a perfect example. Or malls. Some of them are closing down permanently. Convert them into, well, A, affordable housing, but that's a whole other conversation. Or B, homeless shelters. There are options. It's just a matter of these cities deciding, okay, we actually are going to make a huge impact. Yeah, and do so with human dignity. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the issues that I would have to imagine comes up for someone. Like, if I'm being told, hey, there's a space where you can go, but there are all these rules attached to it, and it feels to me like strings are attached to it, to me that just feels like it is lacking in human dignity in some ways. And I genuinely believe that the the effort behind creating a homeless shelter is probably a good one. But we just have to make sure that we remember that these are people mm-hmm. that we're trying to, first and foremost, make sure are cared for, um, rather than viewing it as, oh, this place is a receptacle for the people that we don't want to see in our city. Right. It's two very different approaches. And it often does feel that way. Um, I I don't think we talked about this or maybe we brought it up briefly, but, you know, even something like L.A. clearing all of the homeless people out so that they could host the Oscars at Union Station or Mm -hmm. like San Francisco loves to do that as well um, when there's like major events happening in the city. And it it just (laughs) it really does feel or it seems very dehumanizing to just kind of like push people that are really struggling to the outskirts and then later on they just push them back or they push them to a new area and it just it's not really solving the issue it's just kind of sweeping it under the rug agreed okay so we are now joined by tiara welcome tiara to the show one of our bay level patrons yes hello everybody hi how are you doing um, I'm super sick. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually got back from Chicago yesterday because I was on vacation and I came back and I woke up and I was really sick. So. Oh, well, Ugh, thanks for joining sucks. us anyway. Yeah, I tried to nap most of the day. So okay. I had energy. Okay, good, good. Um, so tell us about yourself and what you do. Yeah, so I basically started a YouTube channel back in 2017, I believe. And I don't do that full time, though. Unfortunately, it's not my full time yet. And I have been really passionate about fashion for a really long time. And I started on Instagram. And then I realized that Instagram was not necessarily the platform that I wanted to be on. So I switched over to YouTube. It's been something I'd wanted to do for over 10 years. And I was too afraid to put myself out there. Because, you know, people can be really mean and vicious online. I'm sure you guys well know. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I basically one day woke up and said, fuck it, I'm going to do it. Love that. (laughs) Yeah. And I invested uh, some money into a really nice camera and a microphone and all that. And it started small and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And now I have a pretty good size following on YouTube. And then I trans over, I transitioned over to TikTok and I have an even bigger following on TikTok. Oh, I didn't know that. Nice. That's okay. awesome. Yeah. I do mainly fashion. That's like my, that's kind of my thing. I am trying to figure out whether or not I'm going to branch out and do more like lifestyle vlogs and stuff like that, because it's hard to put out consistent fashion videos when a lot of it you're paying for yourself. Yeah, so it's kind of yeah, expensive. So kind of my. Well, I'm really lucky that now companies start sending me clothes to review, so that's yes. been really helpful. Heck Hashtag yeah. influencer. Look Love at this, that. eighty thousand yeah, followers on TikTok. A little bit of imposter syndrome. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, I understand. We understand. Well, thank you again for joining us and for that rundown. I know you were interested in talking about American clothing sizing for women and how current standards leave certain size ranges underserved. Um, Could you give us a quick rundown about straight sizes, mid sizes and plus sizes? Yeah. So basically um, the reason why I started my channel is because I'm, I fall very firmly in this uh, sizing called mid size range, or that's what it used to be um, called. So you have straight sizes, which is usually about a, you know, zero to 
eight. And then you have these mid sizes, which start um, 10 to about 16. And then plus sizes start from 16 and up. Uh, it's kind of an outdated way of saying it, but that's how I still look at it. And uh, a midsize range falls from a size large to usually a double XL is a pretty standard clothing. And if anybody has ever gone to a store who's above a medium knows that it's almost impossible to find larges. And then for plus size stores, it's really almost impossible to find um, like the smaller sizes and those stores. And that's why this mid range area is so difficult to fit. And it's kind of, I think it's like weird because a standard American woman is a size 16 and usually a large to extra large. And that's why it's such an un, like underserved industry because mm. I have literally, when I was at my thinnest, I was a size large you know, and I've gained weight and I'm still only an extra large. So it's just a weird, it's like this weird place to be. So you Mm -hmm. touched a little bit on the difficulty for finding these sizes when you're not of a straight sized, uh, you know, size. Um, But can you maybe elaborate a little bit more on that and talk about how also the inconsistencies between different brands and their sizing kind of plays into that? Yeah, so basically... Um, America doesn't really have a standardized sizing. Um, Sometimes it's vanity sizing. So a lot of times like plus size industry does this where if you go into Torrid, they, their stars, like their sizes aren't the normal sizes. They start at like a one, two, like a zero, one, two, three. So it's really hard to pick your size because it's not a typical, like, you know, 10, 12, 14 or whatever. And the thing that women's sizing does that men like doesn't do that men's sizes do is that a lot of times men's sizes go based on measurements and women's sizes don't do this. So that means that every brand can basically make up their own sizing. Like you can get a size 12 at four different stores and every single one of them are completely different, which is so frustrating and incredibly challenging. And it's just, it's something that really irks me because there have been many a time where I am such a normal, like average size and I leave the store or the mall absolutely in tears because I can't find anything that fits me. Mm. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought this up because I have absolutely had the experience of generally knowing what size I am and going shopping And not even between different stores, just between different brands and cuts of things that that one store carries have that size 16, for example, be entirely different than the other size 16. So it is really hard if you're buying women's clothes to know what's going to fit you which means if you're shopping online, for example, it's kind of a gamble. You have to hope that they have a really generous return and exchange policy. Um, so yeah, super duper frustrating. I had no um, idea about that. Yeah, it's it's really frustrating. Yeah. Um, that's why I basically started my channel because I do the shopping so that you don't have to. And <laughs> I'm pretty honest about sizing. And like most women, I have to buy a lot of my stuff online because... Um, I don't necessarily fit in a standard mall store. So I used to do this series where it was like fitting room vlogs where I would go to a popular store and then I would try on clothes that were in my size. And then like from there, you could see how they kind of fit on me. But then the pandemic happened. And so I was having to buy a lot of clothes. And yeah, I really had to um, be generous with that return policy for sure. Justin is asking this question, and I had this thought too while you were speaking. Why have the variable sizes? Is it to get people to try things on in the store? But what's the advantage of that? I will say that to me, it always feels like it's meant to give you a bit of a complex. And I'm sure that a lot of young girls um, feel this way too, because there's so much pressure that's put on women to look a certain way. And if you're already struggling with that, it really messes you up when you go to one store and you're a size 12, but then you go to another store and you're a size 18, and then you go to this store and you're a large, and you go to the other store and you're like a double X. It literally makes no sense. Yeah, I just chalk it up to there being no consistent um, scale that is supposed to be used. I mean, like, again, like Tiara was saying with... Um, 
men's sizes, it's all based on me- actual measurements. So like you have mm-hmm. your, you know, waist, waist. and then your yeah. your legs in inches. I've had Mark ask me this before. He's like, well, what? How? Because like we talk about our goals and things like that. We we're working out. We're trying to get places. But like. He'll be like, okay, so like you want to get to a size 12, like how many inches around the waist is that? And I'm like, I can't give you a firm measurement of what that is because Torrid size 12 is going to be entirely different from the size 12 I get at Kohl's, for example. Yeah. Yeah, So there are companies that are really notorious for um, like their sizing. So like Hollister or any companies like that. They specifically don't want bigger people to wear their clothes because it's bad for their brand. And so that's why the sizing is really inconsistent because a like medium large there is not the same medium large at like American Eagle or any place like that. So I think that's one of the reasons why they can get away with not doing standardized sizing because they specifically don't want a type of demographic to wear their clothes. Wow. And I think with this, there's been um, a lot of dialogue happening on social media, on TikTok, Twitter, et cetera, about um, some of these communities working to sort of like reclaim terminology. And I wanted to ask about the term midsize because there are now certain members of the plus size community that are pushing back against that, wanting to refer to that as small fat instead. What do you make of this? So there's now this um, like scale, I guess, for different terms of like how fat you are. And I don't think that fat is necessarily a bad term. I just think that it has to do with what you're comfortable with, because I don't necessarily see myself as being fat. I see myself as being average. Small fat is now what they want to consider midsize. And the plus size community is doing this because they don't want fat to be a bad word. And it's not necessarily a bad word, but small fat to me is basically just what you're comfortable with. Yeah, that's it is an interesting thing because I've seen that on TikTok and I have wondered about it. And I think, you know, I think you raise a great point that it really just comes down to your comfort level. Like I've gotten a lot more comfortable referring to myself as fat. But I would never refer to anyone else in that way unless I knew they were also comfortable with it because I know that it can be really triggering for people. I mean, for a long time, that word has had such a negative connotation socially. So I actually prefer the term midsize. I know that some people don't like it because it reminds me of a like reminds people of a car, like a midsize car. But for me personally, because I don't fit into the plus size realm. And I don't fit into um, straight sizes. I, I can't shop at a plus size store. Like that's just not, they just don't have clothes that fit me. And so like, I don't feel like I really fit into that necessarily that pocket. And I I can't shop at a straight size store. Mm. So I don't really fit in that pocket either. So for me personally, I prefer the term midsize, but I understand and I could feel for people who prefer the size small fat, but it's just, it is again just what you're comfortable with. I'll continue to use the size midsize or the term midsize for me. And then it's what everybody else is comfortable using, I'll use for them. Exactly. Speaking of finding clothes, uh, can you talk a little bit about a few cro- clothing brands that you like that are more size inclusive than some of the stores that you might find at a mall, for example? Well, a really good mall store, if like let's start from there, like what's, um, uh, like financially accessible is uh, Old Navy. Old Navy actually does a really good size with their size inclusivity, but they aren't necessarily the best made clothes. And so you kind of have one of them. So I find that H&M is like actually pretty good about their sizing because I do feel like they have more standardized sizing. Mm. So I can almost find something that will fit me in H&M because they're standard across the board. But if I'm going to be personally shopping for myself, there are some Asian brands that I feel do a pretty good job. Now you kind of go into the industry of um, like whether or not you want to support Asian brands. But I actually like um, Fashion Nova. I feel like they do a pretty good job, but it is fast fashion. So you have to think about that. And then 
for certain things, I think that she in curve line does a pretty good job. But personally, where I shop is I shop at American based brands. So I particularly like pinup girl clothing. Um, I like unique vintage and I like uh, Vixen by Michelin Pitt. Now, these are very specific types of clothing. They're really made for curvy women, but they're super size inclusive, but it's this particular style. So if you mm-hmm. like those 1950s, you know, 1960s and up style, then that's really um, something that I suggest. Their clothing is really expensive because they're all made in the United States and they're American-based companies. But I prefer to pay for something I know is going to last me a really long time. I know that that's not accessible for everybody, which is why I try and give you like, um, like try on videos of the like a whole bunch of different companies. I guess you can see it as a long term investment too. If you're Mm -hmm. putting the money into it, it's going to last you a while instead of buying a new dress every two weeks. They also hold their resale value. So Uh, I can um, go back and when I'm done with an item or when I buy an item that I just decide, like I bought a bunch of stuff before the pandemic, right? And then during the pandemic, I didn't wear any of it. So then kind of it goes to this whole thing of, well, I'm not going to wear this stuff. And honestly, I'm not sure if I want to wear a super tight fitting dress in my post pandemic body anymore. And so Mm. I can really easily resell those clothes, which is again, part of the investment because they hold their value. I had a follow up question since you were talking about uh, pricing, but, um, and maybe you don't have the answer to this, but I'm curious about why it is that uh, plus size clothing often in stores is way more expensive than, you know, like a straight size clothing would be like, even with something like Torrid, where the quality seems comparable, you know, to something like, um, like Forever 21, for example, Uh, they charge expensive prices because they can, because Mm, there's not a ton of options on the market. And so they can charge more, especially Torrid is pretty notorious for this. Um, I'm going to be really frank. I don't like Torrid's clothing. There's like two stores in the mall that you can usually find that'll cater to plus size clothing. Oh, Lane Bryant. Sorry. Lane Bryant is one of them. And that kind of caters to an older woman. So usually, you know, like in her mid thirties to up or whatever you like that particular style, or you have Torrid. Those are your two options. So Torrid knows that you're going to shop there. And so that's why their prices are so expensive. Now, clothing that are more um, size inclusive they're like, I will pay the same exact thing for a, um, for a size large dress at like pit girl clothing as will somebody who is a size four X will pay. Like mm. there's no discrepancies in prices. That's yeah. awesome. Something, you know, I'm so glad you brought up the Torrid example because they kind of make me crazy. I do go there sometimes and I will buy certain items, but sometimes I feel like it requires a lot of searching to find something that I actually like there. Because it's like, one, I don't want something with rhinestones plastered all over it. And I don't want this huge, ugly ass floral print. Something that drives me insane about plus size clothes is that it's like, it all looks like Hawaiian shirts (laughs) to me. (laughs) And there's like no, um, no structure a lot of the time in these clothes. It's just like flowy all the time. And it's like, no, maybe I want darts. Like I want. I want some structure to my clothes just because I'm a larger person doesn't mean that I want to wear a sack. Yeah. in Torrid in particular, they don't necessarily, I feel like they design for a very specific plus size woman. So somebody who has a large belly, you know, bigger hips and a large butt, that's not a lot of people's body type. I have a large bust and I have large tips, hips, but I do not have a large belly. That's just my, that's just my particular body type. And there's a lot of plus size women out there who just don't have large busts or they don't have a large belly. And so right. they're, you, they, they still can't shop at Torrid, even though it's one of the few options that they have. And yet Torrid, Torrid like price gouges like crazy. Mm. Yeah, that drives me nuts. I, I feel like we kind of started getting into my next question here, which is what things or what boxes do we look for brands to check in order to be considered size inclusive. Um, I know that we had mentioned pricing as one aspect of that and also just clothing design and like whose body 
is this plus size clothing being designed for or whose body is this mid size clothing being designed for? But is there anything else that uh, Pam or Tiara that y'all would include? For me in particular, I would include style because mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of times people expect that if you're plus size, you aren't allowed to have a style. And I think that that's completely false. I like to see a company that is size inclusive, that if they have like an item that is for a um, straight size, that the item comes then in a, you know, in one of the larger sizes. Like to me, that's important because I feel like everybody should be able to pick their style and not everybody needs to wear flowy dresses because they have a tummy. Like you don't need to hide your tummy. Like, who cares? It's what you feel comfortable in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, style's a big one for me. Um, I also wanted to just give a shout out to Mod Cloth because I really appreciate that that you can buy, you know, this like if you and a friend were a size two and a size 20, you could both buy the same dress and there would be like, you know, no differences in in the general style of the dress you know, aside from the fact that one would be bigger. And so I do appreciate that. Um, But yeah, I definitely have, you know, certain cuts and stuff like that, that I prefer. And so anytime that a store um, features those cuts in something that will fit me, that's usually where I'll go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's um, a really good point. Like it's just, I, I, I just think it's so frustrating because it's honestly not that much harder. Like they have to make a new pattern because you can't just take a straight size and then just up the size. You have to make a whole new pattern, but it's worth it if you're, because they're basically isolating an entire population of women. I mean, I only have like, I, I honestly don't know very many women who fall into a medium or below. Like a lot of my friends are in a large and up. And I feel like they're completely isolating this entire population because they don't want to be seen as size inclusive. Or if they are size inclusive, it's fake. I mean, let's be honest, like Forever 21, size inclusivity, you can only buy, I mean, very few locations actually have the plus size in the store. And it's almost always super ugly. And I feel like a lot of these locations, if they do have a plus size section or anything that's beyond straight sizes, they hide it in the back. Yeah, I was going to say. So embarrassing. Oh, my gosh. And it's especially really if you have to ask for something and they'll be like, oh, we keep those sizes in the back. Like, it's some shameful thing. And I'm just like, oh, my God, please, can I just live? That's ridiculous. You yeah. know, Macy's <laughs> does this, too. And I don't know if it's all Macy's, but Macy's in San Francisco, they have, like, a huge five-story one. They have an entire floor for women, but the plus-size clothes for women, and it's always the same brands. Is on a completely different floor. And I've never really understood why that needs to be the case because you sell Levi's for women on, say, the second floor. So why don't you just put the plus size Levi's there, too, so that you don't have to go searching for it on a completely different floor? Or my favorite is when I ask for a size extra large and they tell me, oh, we only have those online. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why have it here? Like, why say that you have a plus size section Yeah, and you don't even have... Like a size extra large yeah. in your store. That seems yeah. ridiculous to me. It's the same with, I, I don't have this problem, but my mom is a, um, she wears a wide shoe and she can hardly ever find um, shoes that she can actually try on in the store. And I know that, that that's a problem also for, for women that are, you know, larger body. Mm-hmm. Sometimes their feet are larger too. And it really sucks that they just can't go to a store and, you know, try yeah. something on to see if it'll fit. Everyone needs clothes. Yeah. If, if you know, they don't have XLs available because it's a storage issue, maybe. How about just having less variety of clothes? Because, like, if I go into an H&M, women get an entire floor and then men get, like, a little corner in the back. Maybe there should just be less variety so they can store more sizes. I don't know about you guys, but every time that I go shopping, there are, like, 15 extra smalls. 15 and then there's like 10 smalls and then five mediums and no larges ever in other yeah. words yeah now is that As because you, nobody's buying the extra smalls or because they're not stocking the larger sizes i or, always assume they don't stock the larger sizes that's oh. crazy see i always assumed that that people that were also like largest or extra large just just got there before me that's what i would have guessed it's, yeah. it's probably just that they don't order them right 
It's because they don't order them. And the way that I know this is because my um, my daughters, so my husband has daughters from a previous marriage and they are both extra smalls and smalls. So we have like the complete opposite problems. Uh, even them, like we go into the store and there's like 15 items that they can try on and I have none, none. And I'm just like, how many people are size extra smalls? Like how many people? Yeah. Like it makes no sense to me. It's because they don't stock them. Yeah. Uh, and especially with where we are, I mean, it's not even just an American thing at this point. Like globally, people are getting bigger. So you really do have to question and ask, like, how, like, who are we catering to here, especially considering what our population looks like? So I lived in Germany for a year and I had to go shopping there for winter clothes because I'm from California and I literally came to Germany with a pair of vans and some jeans. So I had to go shopping for winter clothes and my hips at the time were 42 inches. Now, Germans generally are bigger people. They're tall, you know, they're usually a little bit more of like a wider body type than me, who's pretty short and super curvy, I could not find a single pair of pants that had a 42 inch waist. And they do do sizing by inches or centimeters for them. And I I just couldn't find anything. And I'm just Hmm. like, so this is like clearly a global problem because I'm in Germany and I still can't find clothes that'll fit me. And I was 18 years old, 18. So I was like, at least 50 pounds lighter than I am now. Mm-hmm. Right. Is I don't know if there is, but is there anything that people can do right now to encourage brands to be more size inclusive and try and sort of solve this issue? I mean, I guess it's the way you could do is just shop at start shopping at the companies that have size inclusivity and, you know, try and invest a little bit of money in your clothing for brands who are, you know, making the effort to do that. And um, that's why I started doing it, because I wanted to make sure that these companies that I really like to are size inclusive continue to get business. So I, you know, like I do spend a little bit of extra money here and there for the clothes that I really, the companies that I really enjoy. And I feel like that's what a lot of people can do. I know that Ishaki will make clothes for like any measurements, like they, they cut them to your size and Mod Cloth does a really, really good job and size inclusivity. So just look up brands who do that. And fast fashion, fast fashion is really killing the fashion industry. Mm. So I know that I'm like the one who's like, I buy clothes from every company. I do like, you know, I buy clothes from Shein. I buy clothes from Fashion Nova. I buy all these clothes that aren't considered fast fashion, but I do it for a reason to show people that they're really not size inclusive. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Such a good point. It's really hard if you're trying to just first figure out where can I buy clothes that fit me um, to then be confronted with the fast fashion issue. So we really appreciate you bringing this to light for us on today's show. Really interesting. And I think it's a very important issue. So thank you, Tiara. And we can find you at Pinup and Fantasies on YouTube and TikTok where she has blown up. You could find me, you could find me on Pinup and Fantasies pretty much everywhere. Pinup so. and Fantasies everywhere. Okay. Yeah, pretty much everywhere. I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok and I'm sure somewhere in there I have a random account that was supposed to be the new social media. <laughs> right, you wanted to get in at the ground floor. You want to grab you want your to get username. In and it never took off. Right. <laughs> well, you have the username now, at least. I have Patreon as well. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. But right now, it's kind of on a hiatus because Patreon is a lot of work. Yes. It's a yes. lot of work. <laughs> it's hard to do on your own, yeah. for sure. So I'm kind of I'm kind of on a posting hiatus. I gave uh, Tiara a couple lessons uh, a couple years ago, or just last year, actually. So we will have uh, Tiara join us in After Dark today as well. And Tiara, thank you very much for your support on Patreon and your longtime support and listenership. We really appreciate it. And Thank you for your expertise today. And we will get into some recommendations now. So this is one I think I spoke about a while ago, and maybe I did recommend it, but it's been such a long time and it continues to be a big part of my life. And that is oat milk. 
I kind of tried it by accident a couple of years ago at a local coffee shop in Chicago. And immediately, immediately I was like, damn, this is a milk alternative that is actually good. I liked almond milk. I liked that it was an alternative to dairy milk, but I didn't enjoy it. Oat milk from the very start, I've enjoyed in every single type of oat milk. I have greatly enjoyed. I just think how it's made with oats makes all the difference. It has such a better taste. So um, I want to recommend specifically Silk's Oat Yeah. Such a stupid name, but Oat Yeah. And at Costco and probably elsewhere, there is an extra creamy version of the oat milk. I don't need the extra creamy, but it's the only one that Costco sells and it's at a really good price. Um, But really, any oat milk is very, very good. And everybody's getting in on it. You go to any coffee shop now, even local ones, and I see oat milk and I cannot have any other type of milk anymore. Like Starbucks, they've had this damn shortage. I... uh. I started bringing my own oat milk to the store. I'm like, oh my gosh, wow. amazing. Give it to me black. That. I'm pouring my own oat milk <laughs> in. Y'all are letting me down. So oat milk, big fan right now. I wanted to recommend a podcast from NPR, um, Through Line. They're really great. They're looking at um, historical events through a modern lens to understand how those events have had an impact on our current world. And they're currently doing a series on capitalism, which is super interesting. Hmm. Highly recommend. I also have a podcast recommendation on the completely different end of the spectrum. (laughs) There's a show that I've talked about on here before called Dissect, and they have an offshoot podcast now called Keynotes. I really, really enjoyed the first episode, which is called Why Music Gives You Skin Orgasms. It's about the science behind why some people get goosebumps or chills when they hear specific songs and not only once, but why it continuously keeps happening no matter how many times you listen to that song. It's super good, really well done. They also use some um, classical examples of songs that have been known to give most people chills as long um, in addition to some newer releases that uh, tend to give people chills as well. So uh, if you're looking for something fun to listen to and you just want to like learn a little bit more about music theory and a little bit of the science behind music, I would recommend checking that out. Cool. And speaking of Pam and music and Pam's recommendations, we've been binging This Is Pop on Netflix. Oh, are you liking it? Yeah, it is very is good. This so fun? Super interesting, I really too. Like and just it. how yeah. all of this history is presented is very entertaining as well. Mm-hmm. And Tiara, what's your rec? So I'm actually going to recommend a, another creator. She's mainly on Instagram, but she also has a blog. And her name is Fuller Figure Fuller Bust, all in one word. And she is um, a plus size creator who is mainly in the 1950s realm, but she has like her own style and she's a model, but she also, um, especially lately has been talking about her struggles with infertility. And I also struggle with infertility and it's really refreshing to see somebody who's talking so eloquently and putting um, how I feel in like out there for the word, for the world to see, because it's hard sometimes when you're going through something so personal to put that out there. And she is fantastic. Her posts always make me cry because she's so good at writing on what it's really like to want something so bad that you can't have. And right now she's pregnant and she basically goes through all, all the things and she's amazing. So I suggest that everybody go, you know, look at her page, fuller figure, fuller bust on Instagram and just read their posts, especially if you're dealing with infertility or have dealt with infertility in the past. Well, thank you again, Tiara, for your support on Patreon. We really appreciate it. We would appreciate everybody else's support, too. It does keep the show running. Patreon.com slash millennial is where you can pledge today and you'll you'll receive instant access to lots of benefits, including After Dark. And on today's installment of After Dark, we're doing this kind of pie in the sky. What would you do with the uh, money from a COVID sweepstakes if you got vaccinated, if you were entered to win? Uh Nevada actually is kicking off its COVID vaccine sweepstakes within the next few days. So I got my fingers crossed for a big win. (laughs) We'll see what happens. If there's no show next week, I won and I quit. (laughs) No, you got to invest in millennial. (laughs) There we go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. 
Andrew's like, no. Um. <laughs> no, no, I would. I would in, in growing the show. And that's what we use people's support on uh, Patreon for as well. So it's greatly appreciated. So that'll be available at patreon.com slash millennial today. It's part of Mega Millennial, which is the main show ad free with After Dark at the end. So you get everything we have to offer, all of our main show, uh, bonus show content all in one file. Also, please be sure to follow us for free on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. If you have any feedback today, we would love uh, feedback about our discussion with Tiara, for example. You can email millennialshow at gmail.com or by using the contact form or anonymous confessional on millennialshow.com. And finally, you can follow us on social media. We are Millennial Show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and uh, you'll get show previews and more. So thanks, everybody, for listening to today's episode. I'm Andrew. I'm Laura. I'm Pamela. And I'm Tiara. Bye, Bye, everyone.